Oh, I forgot to turn my lights on. That's what's going on. You look fine. Know, it's going to get dark here pretty soon. <laughs> oh, you've got, that's the sun. That's the sun. The natural light. I always close my dark. blackout curtains before the show because I want to get the lighting yeah. right. Uh, maybe I should turn. Oh, the lighting is still like next layer of thing I have to do. I have to do two things. I have to get better lighting and I have to get glasses that don't have glare. Mm. So that. I want to do the show from a laying down position. What do we think about that? <laughs> I like a laying down position. I think a lot of lie down. What if I'm just sideways during the show? I think that just, I don't see how that will improve your level of awakening. Yeah. Justin tried I it think... once and he ended up sleeping. Yeah, that's right. I've I remember. Been a good for a while. Yeah, guys, but we're going to start a show now. Yeah, let's you, start a show. You guys ready to actually start the show? Because I'm so ready. We're going to start the show now in three, two. This is Twists. This Week in Science, episode number 629, recorded on Wednesday, July 26th, 2017. Vaccinate against ignorance. I'm Dr. Kiki, and today on This Week in Science, we are going to fill your heads with dead brains, Neanderthals, and snail smear. But first. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. If you lose your keys, your phone, and your wallet, it's probably not your best of days, but you are still you. I'll wreck your car, your dog might run away, and you will still be you. You can lose a toe, a foot, a leg, or even legs, and still get around without them. Missing both of your arms might rank you low on the friends I will call to help me move list, but you are still you. Having a spine is simply divine, but it's oak if yours is broke. You are still going to be you. Your brain, however, is different. Your brain is where you keep yourself. It's where you live. It is you, and you are it. So take good care of yourself by taking good care of your brain. There is nothing you can do without your brain. And without your brain, or without you, your brain would have nothing to do. Unless, of course, you were to hook it up directly to This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week there's only one place to go to find the knowledge i seek i want to know what's happening what's happening what's happening this week in science what's happening what's happening what's happening this week in science science to kiki and blair and a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back yet again to talk about the last week of, of science, all the things that happened in the world, and there sure are a lot of them. Very sciencey. Did you guys have a good science week? I did. There was lots of good science this week. So much. Always yeah. so much yeah. to read. I got to, uh, I got to drive a soon to be released full electric car Ooh. it was fun it's a very blast of a test drive that thing Stay is can you say what car it was fast, it was a fast oh yeah it's the new honda clarity the new honda clarity that interesting has a lot of get up and go <laughs> it's a fun car to drive fun like electric we like electric here the it you know there was a big thing on npr today opb here up in portland talking about is it going is the combustion engine on its way out and it indeed may be yes finally i know we'll see just about I mean, 30 years later than it should have been <laughs> yeah but you know at least that's where we've gotten that's yeah we've absolutely gotten. progress We're is progress there. it's progress and I'm not going to shoot us in the foot as we keep making that progress. I want to just keep us going so that we don't limp. No limping. Let's just march straight ahead. All right, everyone. This is This Week in Science. And on this week's episode, got lots of science. Like I said, we have stories about football and brains, aging and brains, and alcohol and memory. Hmm. Yeah. What do you have, Justin? 
I brought uh, Neanderthals uh, and brains. Uh, <laughs> how to talk to yourself or your brain, how your brain should talk to itself. And uh, what is it called? Uh, that thing that we're all going to have to do. Geoengineering. Bum, bum, bum. Oh, I hope we don't have to do a lot of that. But yeah, okay. All well, right. We've been doing it. We just got to do yeah. it different. You know, we're like, you know, we're we're just the the upright version of beavers building our dams. <sighs> Blair, what's in the animal corner? Oh, um, let's see. I brought ants, uh, DJ whales, <laughs> uh, giant invasive snails, and um, gaping sharks. Gaping. <laughs> Gaping. I, yeah, I really it's, you know, know what just to picture, do. just picture a shark mouth agape coming toward you. Uh, ah, I'm going to talk about that later. Oh. Hey, it is Shark Week, right? It is Shark Week. So is it? Yes. Oh, man. It's good timing. I should have talked or, about cows then. Uh, or if you wanted to talk, you know. There's a... Yeah, they're not as scary, though, when a, when a cow comes with you with its ma all... More people oh, die by cow than by shark every year by about tenfold. Right. So, How yeah, come you so know that? If you, if you don't want to celebrate <laughs> Shark Week, you can always celebrate Snark Week. Yes. Good. How do you have that ready to go, Blair? That statistic on cow versus shark death. How Hi, is my name is Blair. Been, I work with animals. She's been recording this forever. Come on, you guys. She's I like, oh like the last she's four years. Villainized animal species and mm -hmm. groups. In particular, mm -hmm. sharks are one of them. More yes. people die every year by being crushed by vending machines okay. than by okay. sharks. Okay, sharks. We got lots of things that know. kill people but that, that aren't sharks. Yeah. But it's time for us to get moving on okay, into the great. show. Let's do it. <laughs> what has science done for me lately? This week, we have a letter from Minion Tracy Wame Adams. What has science done for me lately? Science gives me hope for foster children of the future. I am a foster parent and I'm constantly looking for ways to help my kids. Behavioral science helps, but the changes in the brain due to trauma coupled with genetic predisposition for psychological illness and addiction gives some of these kids a tough road, especially without stability. I look forward to a future where CRISPR and individualized medicine can help with the battle and hopefully reduce the kids that end up in the foster system. I'm also happy that our understanding of PTSD has increased and hopefully the kids are less likely to just be labeled as bad kids. That's great. Thank oh, you, Tracy. That is, that's something that I would not have thought of. So this is why I love getting letters from everybody who listens to this show. It's just wonderful to get new perspectives on the ways that science influences the world. And this is one that's uh, very, it's going to be influential in kids' lives, how they grow up, how they're able to survive in our society. So Tracy, thank you for that. And everyone remember that we do need you to write in to let us know what science has done for you lately. What does it do for you every day? What does it do? Leave us a message on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash This Week in Science. It's the easiest place to reach me. But if you like the emails, just email me at kikifinch at gmail.com because my email is still not fixed because I don't know what to do. Anyway, we're going to fill this segment of the show with something from our Minion community every single week of the year. And you are helping us do that. So thank you so much for writing in. Please keep writing. Tell us your stories. I love reading them every week. Thank you so much. And with that, we'll dive into the science yes. for the week. Yeah, it's time for some science news, y'all. So the big story this week that I that I happened upon is basically a story of headlines, a bunch of headlines saying, football causes brain damage. Football uh, is bad for brains. Yeah, that okay. checks out. <laughs> Look. So I just want to just clarify. Just a quick clarification of what you just said. The football itself is not responsible. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, maybe not the football, but the smacking of the head into other people, into the ground. Um, Impact sports like boxing and football have been known to cause behavioral changes, uh, degeneration into dementia over the lifetime of individuals, but there have been very few studies to date of the brain. And and the most recent study was a wonderful uh, study of 202 brains from football players who donated their brains to science. And so these were individuals who had pretty much been diagnosed with behavioral issues, uh, tremors, dementia, um, aggression, many different kinds of behavioral issues over the course of their careers. And the individuals who donated their brains were from high school level football all the way through professional level football players. Um, And uh, for international listeners, we're talking about American United States football, not soccer, because we had football here and we just, of course, couldn't adopt the name of this soccer. Anyway, the brains that they looked at, everybody wants to say that the behavioral issues that we're seeing are caused by trauma to the brain and that you can actually see the damage to the brain. Well, they went in, these researchers went in, and yes, indeed, they looked at these, they looked at the brains of in post-mortem, so these donated brains, and they found that uh, a particular, they could diagnose neuropathologically by looking at the extent of damage to the tissue of the brain uh, that individuals had chronic traumatic encephalopathy. CTE. And this is this chronic traumatic encephalopathy is thought to underlie a lot of the behavioral issues. And so they found CTE in 177 players out of the 202 donated brains. So 87% of uh, the brains they came across had CTE, had damage that could be identified in that way. Um, 99% of the brains from the National Football League were diagnosed with the CTE. A very low percentage uh, in the younger level of players, uh, but they still did find, uh, they still did find symptoms uh, in the, in the lower levels of play. So in Former college players, they found 56% of the tissue of the brain tissue had this di- diagnosis. Semi-professional and a, a smaller number of brains, again, 56% of those individuals. Um, and then they also looked at, they wanted to compare across this. They did surveys with the family members of and the medical history of the brain, the people's families and the brains that they that they looked at and they found that um, that there was a high correlation of dementia of um, mood and behavioral symptoms of these cognitive symptoms across the board so um, basically there's no smoking gun we don't have a cause. We can't say, yes, if you play football, you're going to have brain damage and it's going to affect your brain's ability to function. We can't say that causally, but the correlative evidence is very strong that CTE may be related to prior participation in impact sports like football. It just seems like... Yeah, but that's not science. Yeah, I know that's not it science. Just, it just right. seems totally like right. is where those headlines are coming from. Absolutely. And well, and we want to have a reason. We want to say, okay, they hit their heads a bunch of times that caused damage to the neurons, right. and then it led to this deterioration. Yes. yes. And Physical that's what they're looking for. Often causes problems. So so now we have to get real scientific with it, and jo- not just to prove that it's an issue, but to figure out how to fix it. Mm-hmm. So we have to figure out what exactly the mechanism is, where the problem is stemming from, and what we can do to prevent it. And if there's nothing that we can do to prevent it, maybe there's a larger conversation that will come from this. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
Yeah. Uh, we have to do our science can, before we can no. have that conversation. I mean, there's a lot that is coming from this already. I don't, I've already done this stuff before. I mean, the helmets are getting better. Mm -hmm. The the there are uh, impact meters that are uh, being worked on to be, to try and create meters to let individuals know how hard they hit their head against something. Like you should be worried kind of concussion level yeah. stuff. Well, especially since you don't always know if you're the one who got the concussion, how bad it is until yeah. several hours to days later. Not to mention if your livelihood is based on going back in the game, you might just mm -hmm. say, I'm fine and go back in the game. And when it's a professional yeah, sport, as opposed to high school, there's a higher likelihood that professionals, when money's on the line, that uh, they are going to go back in the game. They're going to get a cortisone shot or something, and they're going to just get right back out there. Well, but directly related to get, that, too, I do want to mention also, there there are, hold on, I'm, I'm just going to say okay. there are high school teams out there. There are developing brains. Yeah, college, developing, we know yeah. that, that in college still your brain is developing. High school, college, people under 28 years old their brain is still developing. So if we can learn some of the science behind what happens with repeated concussions in a developing brain, that is also really important to know. Yeah. What were you trying to say, Justin? So, uh, for well, for those who, uh, they have been changing the rules of football. Football is completely Absolutely. aware of this. Um, they've been... They've been changing when it's when you can come into contact with somebody. They've been getting they got rid of helmet to helmet. It's a penalty. You're not allowed to do it. They've had to retrain how they play defense. And if you are caught uh, having a concussion, um, you're going to be under evaluation. You're not returning to the game. You're not returning next week's game. Out for a while. Whether those measures are enough to save the sport of football or the players. Uh, the future will tell, but, but they are conscientious of it. And, and, you know, when we, when we say something that like, we have the, these, these correlative statistics, um, that are, and that that's not science yet. Well, the mechanism hasn't been scientifically derived mm -hmm. perhaps, but I think a good correlative, we're not saying like, well, gosh, football players who are happen to be Gemini's also tend to have concussions. That would be a correlative because that I mean, this is this is more like evidence. This is a this is a fact, and this is evidence towards what we can pretty clearly assume is taking place here. Yeah. Um. And I think yeah. that I, I think we 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 can't draw too thick of a red line between uh, something that's a strong correlation and evidence of uh, you know science uh, being scientific evidence of something. I I I. I think there's there's points at which we can see that we have yes a, a reason for a greater study, but an immediate reason to uh, perhaps perhaps uh, you know make a decision about whether or not is in full contact football. I, I I don't think you need to wait for more scientific evidence. Right. To know I mean, so far, so far, and it's because it's not just football, it's other impact sports as well that are working on this kind of study, you know. Um, the, the questions still at large are, is it symptomatic impacts where you have a definite concussion or asymptomatic impacts over time where there you have impacts but not enough to keep you out of the game? Um, are these asymptomatic impacts over time actually are they more cumulative in the damage that they cause over time? Uh, this study does very well provide evidence that CTE, this chronic traumatic encephalopathy, is a progressive neurodegenerative disease that involves um, aggregation of beta amyloid, which are the, uh, the proteins that are involved in Alzheimer's development and in um, and in, and there, and so there's a there's a bunch of stuff here that could lead to early diagnoses or a particular progression of symptoms that are seen in people um, over time. In addition to helping uh, give a little bit more uh, stronger direction to what studies are needed yet, because right now what they have their their sample set was a very selected set. These were football players who donated their brains because they thought they had issues. And so mm -hmm. 
So it was a very motivated group. To the, there's not a very broad general uh, selection of brains that these researchers are are selecting from. They're not just getting brains from people who randomly had, you know, maybe they played a little pickup football <laughs> or they played a little high school football, but they didn't decide, you know, they have no problems. So they never donated right. their brain. So there, there, there's a, a bunch of stuff in terms of the sample and then for the science of it, but then also the direction of things that we can figure out for protecting people better. Well, and kudos to those people for donating their brains. I, mm. I'm so happy that they were able to try to make a contribution. Yes. It's such an important thing to do. And this is a definite, this, this, is, this study is definitely a step in that right direction to making a contribution to helping people play football and have a good time playing it and not just be worried that they're going to be, you know, have dementia later as a result of playing a game that they love. Um, but moving on up to other stories. Hey, good job, America, United States. We're gonna be great again at getting the measles. Oh boy. Oh. Yeah, make America great at getting the measles, people. Just like the good old days. Go on, keep not vaccinating. Just do that, you know why? Because people are gonna get the measles again. We eliminated the measles from the United States in 2000. There have been the only measles outbreaks that have shown up in the United States since then have been from travelers coming from other countries and leading to an outbreak. Otherwise, measles has been gone in the US. But you know, we've got a few people who've been out in public saying, ah, vaccines are bad and being upset being concerned about the effects of vaccines like uh, the MMR vaccine specifically, which for a while was maligned by, uh, by people who thought that it caused autism, which there's absolutely no evidence that the MMR vaccine leads to autism in children. There's no evidence of that whatsoever. So there's a new study in JAMA, the Journal of... <laughs> JAMA. I just have called it JAMA for so long. American Medical Journal of the American Medical Association. There we go. Um, JAMA Pediatrics that suggests that a mere 5% slip in vaccination rates for the MMR vaccine in kids aged 2 to 11 would triple measles cases in that age group. And that would lead to public health care costs of at least $2.1 million. Most, um, most measles cases uh, can cost about $20,000. And with uh, more serious cases, the, based on how long they stay, people stay in the hospital, whatever, it can be more expensive than that. But they uh, have used population modeling techniques, these researchers out of Stanford and the Baylor College of Medicine to kind of look at what's happening because they're in, pop, in the United States population as a whole and also in pockets around the United States because what we're seeing are small pockets of the population in general. So small communities of people who are deciding to not vaccinate at higher rates that are becoming uh, more, it, it's, it's, it's more and more possible that they will succumb to a measles outbreak. The authors conclude the results of our study find substantial, substantial public health and economic consequences with even minor reductions in MMR coverage due to vaccine hesitancy and directly confront the notion that measles is no longer a threat in the United States. They use a term called vaccine hesitancy, which is that the, the, the hesitancy of individuals to either vaccinate themselves or their children as the result of lies and misinformation that have been spread about the safety of vaccines. And also a misunderstanding about the threat of diseases like measles and how that threat can change as the pop percentage of the population who are unvaccinated increases. Um, even now we have uh, 
we have people in our government who are uh, really there's there's the personal exemption based on personal belief. Uh, people can say, I don't, I don't believe in this. I don't think so. Um, and those are on the, the personal exemptions around the country are on the rise. There are government officials who uh, 18 states allow personal belief exemptions. Um, and there are individuals who are currently working to see about getting rid of requirements across, uh, across the country for vaccinations. So there's, yeah, yeah. And, and they say, that one of the researchers says, every year an increasing number of states are debating non-medical ex exemptions, which are a critical driver of vaccination coverage. This study quantifies the consequences of a rise in measles cases and state dollars that will be spent if personal belief exemptions that can reduce vaccine coverage, coverage are in place. So even though people want to have their personal belief exemption, there are some very valid personal health exemptions, very valid reasons why some individuals should not get vaccines. But there are some things, some things that we should all work together on as a community. Yes. So anyway, hey, y'all, let's get great at getting the needle measles again or everybody can just start vaccinating okay? yeah vaccinate. how about we we recognize that living in a society there are certain rules and one of them is that we don't try to give deadly diseases to a bunch of other people when there's another option yep yep anyway <sighs> I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of emails or comments about this story. I'd love to hear them. I'd love to hear your views on this, everyone. So anyway, this is This Week in Science. It's time for more brain stuff. Justin, what you got? All right. I've got a prop here. You have a prop? You brought I props. I hold this up for that. I brought a prop. <gasps> this is a Neanderthal skull. Whoa. Mm. Looks, it, okay. it looks just like you. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> we all know by now that uh, past modern man mated with Neanderthal, uh, and in the reproductive rat race that ensued, we modern humans are here, are not, at least not entirely here, as traces of Neanderthal genome are still echoing about in many of us. And just what are these echoes up to? The Neanderthals were shorter, stockier. They had wider noses, all decent adaptations to living in colder climates. They likely had lighter hair colors, fairer skin than our original ancestors, and even freckles. They grew to adulthood faster, reproduced less, lived in smaller groups, perfect for nomadic hunters. And they had bigger skulls. But what of these features are present today? What do some owe to Neander ancestry? Researchers at the National Institute of Mental Health have drilled down on one possibility. It has to do with the parts of our brain that enable us to use tools, visualize, and locate objects. Because of all the structural differences between humans and Neanderthals, none more impactful than that of the brain. Not so much the size. Modern humans have human-sized brains to fit in human-sized skulls. But what about the structure of the brain? How might that have differed and how might that be influenced? So they did some analyses to kind of get at where the differences might be with Neanderthals. They had to use morphology of Neanderthal skulls to try to elicit what might be going on on the other side, the inside of that skull. What, what, what's going on with the structure of the brains? And what they found was cranial vault analysis, fossil skulls suggested, parietal lobes of Neanderthals, and in the intraparietal sulcal region. Sulcal, what's a sulcal region? It's in the sulcus, it's on the, the side, it's kind of an area that, it's like a canyon that goes in, yeah, it's an infolding. Focus. Hmm. 
Uh, these indicate that Neanderthals had perhaps more prominent visual systems than modern humans. It has been proposed that Neanderthals depended on visual spatial abilities and tool making for survival, more so than the social affiliation and group activities that typify the success of modern humans. And that Neanderthal brains evolved to preferentially support these visuospatial functions, says Karen Berman at the National Institute of Mental Health. Now we have direct neuroimaging evidence that such trade-offs may still be operative. According to the study, the more a person's genome carries genetic vestiges of Neanderthal, the more certain parts of their brain and skull resemble those of our evolutionary cousins in particular. The parts of our brains that enable us to use tools, visualize, and locate objects owe some of their lineage to Neanderthal-derived gene variants that affect the shape of those structures and to the extent that individual harbors the ancient variants. It's saying that this may include some trade-offs with our social brain. Also may hold clues to understanding deficits seen in things like schizophrenia and autism-related disorders, according to researchers. Might some of us, more than others, harbor Neanderthal-derived gene variants that may bias our brains toward trading sociability, sociability to visual spatial prowess or vice versa, they ask. Test the possibility. Gregory and Berman measured the impact of Neanderthal variants and MRI measures of brain structure in a sample of 221 participants of European uh, drawn from a genetic study of schizophrenia. They created a Neander score based on the amount of Neanderthal-derived genes a person had. This score measured up well with elements of known Neander skull morphology. So, level of gene, uh, Neander gene, uh, the higher likelihood that these people had little bits of morphology elements of the skull that were in line with Neanderthals. And therefore structure, I guess, underneath. They found significant associations with higher Neander score and primary visual cortex. This uh, MRI evidence points to gene variants shared by modern day humans and Neanderthals that is likely involved in the development of the brain's visual system. Similarly, Neanderthal variants impacting development of a particular suspect brain area may help to inform cognitive disability seen in certain Brain disorders, say the research. So here, the uh, Berman and colleagues reported back in 2012 on how genetic variation shapes the structure and function of a brain area called the insula in the autism-related disorder Williams syndrome. People with this rare genetic disorder are, are overly sociable and yet visually, spatially impaired conspicuously opposite to the hypothesized Neanderthal propensities and the more typical and more typical uh, cases on the autism spectrum. Mice with such a gene affected by Williams syndrome is experimentally where the, that uh, the gene is leaded show increased separation anxiety. And I guess they say also here last week, researchers showed that the same genetic variant uh, also appeared to explain why Dogs are friendlier than wolves. <laughs> so it kind of kind of makes sense that uh, you know this is a we I, we know that they had small much smaller social groups uh, the Neanderthals so they probably didn't need as that much brain function for the social um, but it's interesting that the trade off could be right there with that increase in their visual ability. Yeah, I love the idea of a trade-off. I mean, there's always, in physiology, in biology, there is always a trade-off somewhere. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting correlate that they traded their social ability for greater visual acuity. And that may, you know, and now that's potentially the genetic remnants of that are possibly uh, causing some of the disorders that we, the psychological disorders that we see today. Or if you, if you know somebody who's uh, really good with tools, likes working with their hands, but uh, doesn't like people, maybe, uh, maybe they got a lot of Neanderthal in them. <laughs> <laughs> Just do that. 
Maybe don't call them a Neanderthal, though. They might not take that super well, especially if they're already not super social. Yeah, but if that person if is you, if cool that person is you, own it. What? Dave, and work on your mechanical apparatus. <laughs> yeah. Just go Enjoy do it. that. Enjoy. Be the best Neanderthal you can be today. <laughs> I like that. I'd like I'd like a picture of a Neanderthal skull on a T-shirt that says "Be the best Neanderthal you can be today." That would be nice. I like that T-shirt. I'd buy that T-shirt for twenty dollars. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> All right. If you just tuned in, this is this week in science. I, Justin, and Blair are here to tell you that <gasps> it's time for Blair's Animal Corner. Oh, Oh, once again, it's that time. Wow, here we go. She loves a creature, cry that small. Five pet, little pet, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. That are both What you got, Blair? I want to tell you about ants and the harsh world they live in. A recent study from Arizona State University looked at about 300,000 individual ants in a 18-month study, and they wanted to figure out how colonies perform in terms of worker loss, production, and how that affects colony reproduction. And they liken an ant colony to the harshest corporation in the world. The ant colony maximizes production and growth by investing in lots of low-wage employees rather than few well-paid workers. When production needs to be ramped up, more workers are brought on like holiday employees at a warehouse. And when they're a certain age, they are sent out to die working with no further help from corporate. <laughs> this oh, wow. makes a large thriving company. So what did they find in their 18-month study at about 300,000 ants? They were looking at a few different colonies, looking at the dynamic of the animals in that colony. They found that the proportions of colonies of ants who do certain jobs change throughout the year, that's the seasonality they referred to, in a way that facilitates the production of new queens and winged males and workers at different times. So they maximize production by changing labor ratios at different times of year. And there's no retirement for ants. They don't live very long if they're a forager. It's like building a bridge for the Japanese army in Thailand. Forager ant turnover is around 1.7 times per month. Right. When, wow. yeah, that is that's a lot of turnover. Um, and when the ants, the, when they're sent to the surface to collect food at the very end of their life, they're sent up about eighteen days before death. They, the investment that they are then given corresponds to the life they'll have on the surface and the colony doesn't keep investing in them once they start doing their job because they know that they're dying soon. So the colony just, they go, okay, they're going to work for them until for us until they die. And don't, don't look at, don't look them in the face. It'll only humanize them. Right? So <laughs> they don't waste the young fat ones on this job. They stay deep in the nest. So more seeds equal more larva, more workers, a bigger, healthier colony. The goal of every colony, as we know, the same goal of the meaning of life, to reproduce. Mm -hmm. So they found that the colonies had a single queen, but what differed from each colony dependent on size was the number of fathers. Colonies with fewer fathers actually did better than colonies with multiple fathers. Why? Because then there was less fighting between males. That's wasted energy. You don't want to spend time feeding an animal that's just going to fight with another member of your colony and die without doing his job. So having less fathers actually means they are well-nourished and all of them contribute to the colony. So this is interesting. It tells us a lot about ants. Uh, also... As the ants age and then as they die, if they die within the colony, 
they we've talked about this before on the show they'll actually bring the dead out because they don't want it in the colony mm -hmm. two and a half acres of colonies produced in the study enough dead ants to weigh as much as a house cat what? or a or a newborn baby <laughs> Oh joy! Well, wow. I mean, is that like a six-pound newborn baby, that's or like, one of the like ten or eleven pound. pounds? I would, I would guess eight to ten, because that's yeah. most house cats. Yeah, eight to ten. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the, we learned a lot about colony dynamics, and we learned that it's it's definitely it's a well-oiled machine. They don't want to waste energy on any any individual that is not maximizing positive impact for the colony it's kind of like they liken it to a corporation i liken it more to an organism you're you're yeah. putting out especially if you're think about your body if you are low on resources if you are low on food your body stops powering things that are non-essential right. so just like that this colony is only going to put in energy to the areas that are beneficial to the colony. That sounds like fascism to me. Uh, perhaps, perhaps you know, it's, it's, everybody's, it's everybody's, it's everybody's analogy, you know, which, which one yeah. speaks to you more. I mean, coming from physiology, I'm obviously going to relate a colony more to an organism myself right. as well. But, um, yeah, but I, I can definitely see it. harsh corporate world of ants. Yeah, yeah. but see, I, the well, other I'm, thing I'm is, sort of think, I'm sort of seeing it more like Hitler. Like, what I need is more workers. Yeah. And I, if all the artists were to leave the colony at once, I wouldn't notice. Well, Give but here's more the, of the here's the thing: there, they didn't. There was no animosity between work between individuals in the colony. Antimosity. <laughs> good one it's good all one. The, the the ants just went off and did their job so we know also that ants have an intense chemical signaling system we don't know if the older ants are being bullied to the surface we don't know if they just were sun setting and so they said okay it's my time to go up into the field <laughs> that really that's the question i think is what causes think, them I to think, switch well, modes. I don't want to get to the point where we're ant from Oh, boy. <laughs> I it up. Ant from I can't say it. But, um, anthropomorphizing? Ant yeah. Anthropomorphizing? There we go. Yes. Anthropomorphizing. So, but, uh, yeah, it does sound like a pretty harsh life. Well, I mean, I don't know that most insects have anything but a harsh life in comparison to what we we human mammals would call something we'd want to engage in. Maybe to an insect, it's actually a very pleasurable existence. Perhaps. Well, I'm going to move from, from this invertebrate to another one, one that's villainized quite a bit, the giant African land snail. Have you ever seen one of these? No, and why is it vilified? Well, so they're enormous. I actually worked with them when I, I was at the Jerusalem Zoo. They're... You, mean, you mean a bunny rabbit? <laughs> the, the, the giant Jerusalem snail bunny rabbit? I'm talking about a snail the size of the palm of my hand. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh my These God. things are native to East Africa, coastal East Africa, but they are invasive. They're found across Asia mm -hmm the Pacific, and the Americas. Almost all tropical mainlands and islands except for Australia. For once, Australia does not have this invasive species. <laughs> also, <laughs> really uh, also, France. Break. also France, but that's... Not tropical. Different. So the, the giant African land snail is villainized because it's an invasive. And any listener to this show is used to me rambling on about how invasive species are usually bad news. Take an animal not from a place, stick it there. Shocking. It doesn't go like you'd expect. Well, um, these, I believe, are especially thought to be a nuisance because they're not cute. <laughs> they're out in the open. They're enormous. And some people don't like them. They're they're slimy. And snails in general are considered to be pests because they eat crops. But 
and I'm just need to, oh my gosh, as I brought up the images available for this. Yeah. But, it so here's is, the but. I'm going to have sold it. Wow. I told you it's the side of my palm. There we go. And some of them are bigger. So, oh some of them look like bunny rabbits sometimes. Yes, yes. yes absolutely. Oh my goodness. Sometimes so, these snails can eat hundreds of plant species, including vegetable crops and including plaster and stucco and have been described as a major oh, threat to agriculture. So this recent study published in Austral Ecology tested these assumptions that they would be pests, that they would be problemsome, that they would be a huge negative impact on agriculture. And they watched African land snails in native rainforests on Christmas Island. Hmm. They watched them and saw what they like to eat. So first of all, uh, they don't eat as much as we expected. They eat leaf litter. And they don't eat very much of it. They saw hmm. almost no impact on seedling survival, the snails were almost never seen eating live foliage. And in a lab trial, they attempted to feed the snails an exclusive diet of fresh leaves, but the snails died en masse. <gasps> yes. Oh no. So this is a uh, this is a recycler. They almost couldn't distinguish between leaf litter removal by the snails compared to natural decomposition. They eat leaf wow. litter, but not a lot of it. Hmm. It is possible that there are other problems. For example, in Florida, they're known to carry parasites that could be a risk to human health. But for what they investigated, they did not see any sort of disturbance from these giant snails as they expected on plants. So what I'll say is, yeah, I will still stand up and say intentionally releasing exotic species is never a good idea. However, it is nice to see researchers doing actual real observation and research to see exactly what invasive species are likely to do in a new space. And we found out it's not a threat to agriculture. It's not a threat to, to, to foliage. So now we can focus on this parasite issue. We can focus on if it has an impact on other parts of the habitat. Yeah, and a, a big question that we've come up against uh, previously when talking about invasive species is the question of if there's no other animal in the niche that the invasive species is coming, species is coming to fill, is it really a problem or is it actually filling an empty hole in the ecosystem and su and thereby supporting the right. ecosystem, the eco web? Yeah. Sometimes it ha sometimes it happens. It occasionally ha so it's just it's nice to check it out. So we now know it's not the foliage. The foliage is not the issue with these guys. So let's move on. Let's see if their slime trails are causing problems, if they are being eaten by animals that are then getting sick, if they have parasites, these are the questions now to ask. Or I think if that they become a great food source for yeah. some other species that allows another species to flourish. You know, right. Especially if it's species in trouble because their food source has disappeared to this point. This could be helpful. So yeah. that's a good thing we to know. know. But we don't know that. Right. Um, I want to. I want to end the corner on a really fun story, a really quick story about humpback whales. They are, it turns out, the DJs of the deep ocean. Whales, they have their lovely songs that we talk about all the time. A recent study from University of St. Andrews, Scotland, focused on whale songs in the process of changing from one type to another. So they actually learn their songs through uh, social learning, so this isn't a genetically derived trait that a whale sings a particular song. They learn it from each other, which also means their song repertoire grows and changes as they grow and meet new whales. And they found 
that when they were changing from one song to another, those songs in this intermediate stage had some of the old song and some of the new song. The when they were looking at these, as or I like to think of it as a mashup. <laughs> We, when they looked at the hybrid songs, they the way it worked, the themes of the songs, old or new, were intact, and the whales learn songs theme by theme, like we learn versus a human song. What's more, they switched from one song to another when the themes were most similar. So it's like when a DJ changes one song into the next song at a point where the beats are most similar. Wow. Yes. That's wild. Yes. That's cool. They're humpback beat matching. Whales. Yes, humpback whales are the DJs of the hum sea. Humpback whales, beat matching. Yes. Beat matching indeed. Oceanic DJs. I love it. I wish I wish I had some examples to show or to tell. But we'll have to take your word on it. Yes. About the magic of their songs. Yes. Or, you know, one of our listeners could just become a whale biologist and go find out more and then, you know, just appear on our show. <laughs> That's right. Nudge, nudge. Nudge, nudge. Or, yeah, maybe we can get uh, one of the researchers of these humpback whales to come on our show mm -hmm. and bring some whale song for and us. And spin some mad humpback whale beats. That's right, DJ Humpback in the house with in Dr. House. Ben. Burr, burr, All right. <laughs> and on that musical note, we are going to take a quick break and we'll be back in just a few moments with more This Week in Science. Stay tuned. We have more brains. I got some liquor and some memories for you. There's a lot more coming. Hey everyone, thanks so much for listening to us. Again, love having your earballs back. I don't know what that sounded like, but anyway, your eyeballs and your ears back here with us week after week after week. And we do appreciate your listening, your watching being a part of the TWIST community and coming back for more science. We like the conversation in our chat room. We like the conversation on the Facebook page, the conversation on YouTube, all over the place. Conversation. That's what we live for. More talking about science. We like doing this a lot and we hope that you would like to maybe Put twists in your life even more. Help us produce the show, maybe. That's right. If you want an easy way to do that, head on over to twist.org. Head on over to twist.org and click on our Zazzle store link. The Zazzle link will take you to our Twist store at Zazzle, zazzle.com slash This Week in Science, if you want to go directly, where we have our hats and mugs and T-shirts and artwork by Blair in sticker form or pillow form or mouse pad form, all sorts of products that not only advertise twists, remind you how much you love twists, but also give back to twists because a portion of the cost of these items does go directly to us. That's right. We, we get paid when you buy things and it helps us keep this show going. Additionally, you can head over to twist.org and you can click on, let's see if you don't want to click on the Zazzle link, you can click right on that donate button if you're not interested in more stuff in your life and you just want the science in your life. Well, and you still want to help us, 
click on that donate button. The donate button will take you through a nice PayPal interface that will allow you to donate the amount of your choice, um, usually through PayPal or by credit card. Additionally, you can click on the Patreon link that's up at the top of the page. Patreon is a crowdfunding community for creators like us who create podcasts, other artists, writers, um, creators in general. It's a place where you can become a patron of our podcast arts. You just click on that Patreon link on the twist.org page and then click on the link that says become a patron. That's right. That's where you can become a patron and pledge an amount per episode in an ongoing manner so that every uh, episode we release, you support us for whatever amount you choose. And there are different levels of support with uh, gifts that we send back to you to say thanks. Um, But generally, it's just what you feel like giving. And we appreciate every, every dollar that anyone gives. It helps us keep this show going, helps us keep our equipment running, helps us pay ourselves a small stipend for doing the show so that we can keep doing the show and not have to take on other work, you know? Um, These are all the things that are very important. And if you're not interested in helping on the producer side, you know, maybe you can help on the social marketing side. Tell your friends about Twists. Let's grow the Twist Minion Club. Let's grow our community. Let's grow the number of people who are talking about science together. I think that would be a really wonderful thing, and it would help out Twist. We could not do this without you. We thank you for your support. The juices and pills and the creams. Your body's lost toxins, whatever that means. You've stopped eating all of that sinister food. Your dinner tastes awful, so it's gotta be good. And still, you can't believe what a skeptic I am. I can't believe you believe in that shell. We disagree, but I still give a damn. And we're back with more This Week in Science. We are back. Justin, what you got for us? Oh, what do I have? Okay. Uh, Let's see. What do I have here? I've got this. Is this the right story? Wait, yes. Yes, this is the right story. I better do this one. Okay. When we talk to ourselves, we tend to do so in first-person self-talk. Like, why am I so tired? Or, (sighs) that lasagna smells yummy. I'm going to have that. Or, Look at that good-looking person in the mirror. Oh, wait, it's me. And while the first-person train of thought is a fine way to get through a typical day, it may not be the best mode for all situations, according to recent research. Simple act of silently talking to yourself in the third person during stressful times may help to control emotions better. Study led by psychology researchers at Michigan State University and the University of Michigan indicate that such third-person self-talk may constitute an effortless form of self-control. Findings are published online in Scientific Reports, Nature Journal. A Nature Journal. Uh, say, so say a guy named Justin is upset. <laughs> Tree fell in his car and he is not happy about it. His first train of thought might be, oh no, my car is toast. How will I get through this day? By simply reflecting on his feelings in the third person, Justin's car is toast. How will he get through the day? Justin is less emotionally reactive than he addresses himself in the first person, my car is toast. Essentially, quote voice, essentially we think referring to yourself in the third person leads people to think about themselves more similar to how they think about others. And you can see evidence for this in the brain, says Jason Moser. MSU Associate Professor of Psychology. That helps people gain a tiny bit of psychological distance from their experiences, which can often be useful for regulating emotions that would normally go with them. Uh, The study involved two experiments that both significantly reinforced the conclusion. In one experiment, participants viewed neutral and disturbing images and reacted to the images in both the first and third person while their brain activity was monitored by an electroencephalograph. When reacting to the disturbing photos, example given here is a man holding a gun to their head, participants' emotional brain activity decreased very quickly 
within one second when they referred to themselves in the third person. Uh, the researchers also measured participants' effort-related uh, brain activity and found that using the third person self-thinking was no more effortful than using first person self-talk thinking. This uh, bodes well for using third person self-talk as an on-the-spot strategy for regulating one's emotions as many other forms of emotion regulation require considerable thought and effort, according to the researchers. In the other experiment, participants reflected on painful experiences from their past using first and third person language while their brain activity was measured using functional magnetic resonance imaging, FMRI. Similar to the first study, participants displayed less activity in the brain region that is uh, commonly implicated in reflecting on painful emotional experiences when using that third person self-talk, suggesting better emotional regulation. And again, third person self-talk required no more effort-related brain activity than using first person self-talk. Two studies point to the simple task as potentially useful as an emotion regulation strategy, and they have more study planned in the future. Huh. No, you have a nice day. No, you have a nice day. Uh -oh. Right. So having a you conversation have a nice with day. yourself, probably not great. But <laughs> no, using no. third person speech to help analyze your processes, maybe not so bad. Yeah. Uh, I can't help but notice, though, and, and uh, reflect in reading this, that uh, the current president of the United States seems to use that third person self-talk quite a bit. And I also think it would be really annoying if people around you were doing it constantly. That would also be like annoying. But I could see. But you I don't necessarily see... hear the person doing the self-talk. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't necessarily hear them doing it. But if we start doing this out loud. In their head, right? People think out loud all the time. So it could be. I am the crazy person in the grocery store yeah. muttering to herself as she walks down the aisles, pushing the grocery cart. Oh, what do you want to eat? I don't know. I put it on my list. You put it on the list. I'm going to get this. Uh -oh. Oh, oh, my yeah. gosh. Really? Well, it's like, like a two-part conversation. Like <laughs> I don't think that's right. I do walk around the office very often going, I walked over here for a reason. What? It wasn't to get the stapler. What so was instead, it for? instead, what you need to do is Blair walked into this part of the room <laughs> without knowing why she was there. Yikes. Blair walked Blair around the room for a clue, but could find none. <laughs> oh my God. My, <laughs> I think my coworkers would kill yeah. me. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. That would be annoying. However, I what I think we're talking about, where it could be useful, of course, is if somebody who is prone to having emotional uh, difficulties, mm -hmm. if they would employ this as a tool uh, when, when facing a crisis or anxiety or a fear or something of that nature, uh, then, then that might be something uh, very useful to employ as, as a needed strategy. Yeah, and, and, it, and easy to employ. You just have to learn to do it to instead of Practice. talk to yourself as yourself, talk to yourself from another person's perspective. And I think that's probably, it's the, the outward, mm. it's your brain hearing this outward influence as opposed to just its own inf in, inward influence, possibly right. having a little bit more influence. So Kiki. A tree fell on Justin's car. How is Justin gonna get through his day? How is Justin gonna remove this tree from his Kiki, car? Oh, I know, not going Justin's to not going to do that. Justin's <laughs> going to call somebody to remove the tree yeah. from his car and hope that it still runs. Yeah. Blair's going to wake up with the Weird intention it. of exercising, but will hit snooze several times. Ah, <laughs> <sighs> uh, and we all do this. What if you could hit snooze on aging? <gasps> yes, please. You know I want to live to be 200. Right? Well, there's a new study out on the on aging and the brain and a, a region of the brain that might actually be involved in accelerating aging. There are many mm -hmm. factors related to aging as, as they occur that eventually 
we don't regulate, our bodies don't regulate as well anymore. Like just over time, things don't work as well. There's not as much cellular repair. You're maybe not noticing when you're thirsty and so you're not drinking enough water. Maybe they're just, you're not sleeping right, which then leads to even more cellular degradation and lack of repair. So what could be at the root of all this? Researchers think the hypothalamus might be. And this is a region of the brain that helps us regulate body temperature, a bunch of internal conditions like hunger and satiation and, and a, lot of, a lot of things really. Hypothalamus, it's a very, very important central region of the brain. But there's a new study in uh, looking at mice and how the hypothalamus may potentially someday if all this works in humans as well as it does in mice, this could lead to maybe an easy treatment for aging that could let us live longer and healthier lives. So this paper, researchers looked at the hypothalamic stem cells and there are not very many regions in the brain that grow birth new stem cells. The hippocampus is one um, and, and the hypothalamus is another, just it, not at a very high rate, but as you, as the, the adult brain will grow new stem cells, but it gets to be less and less as you age. And so they looked at the mice and they said, as mice get older, the number of stem cells in the hypothalamus plunges, goes way, way down. And so when they're really old, there's no more stem cells. And so they're like, okay, stem cells are like these young cell cells. And so maybe they are doing something that keeps the hypothalamus healthy and young and active. And so they started looking into this and they took a, they took a drug that would, uh, it's an antiviral drug that basically would kill the stem cells in the hypothalamus. And so when they killed about 70% of these stem cells, uh, it decreased how long the mice, the mice lived. By about eight percent, and they number. also and they also had all sorts of kind of behavioral brain problems, memory, um, coordination. They didn't have a lot of endurance. They lost their their muscle tone. That also started going bad, going bad. Um, and then they wanted to see if they could reverse the deterioration that occurred, and so they injected stem cells into the hypothalamus of these middle-aged animals. And so mice that received special stem cells to live in the hypothalamus of this kind of destroyed hip hypothalamus, <laughs> they outlived other mice that had been injected with a different kind of brain cell. They outlived them by like 10%. So the stem cells getting put, put back into the hip hypothalamus affected the mouse lifespan. So then they're like, all right, the timing of this is all kind of weird. You'd think this, the stem cells are going to take a period of time to grow into the hypothalamus and really have an effect. And this, this aging effect, they started seeing behavioral improvements pretty quickly. And so they, they're like, okay, what could be happening with these stem cells? What could the stem cells be doing or releasing into the environment of the hypothalamus that could have an effect? And they hit on these little molecules called microRNAs. And lots of cells manufacture them. They're, just, they, they, they're, they're actually inside of lots of cells, these little tiny segments of RNA. We think they have regulatory purposes, but we're still trying to figure out exactly what they do because there's so many of them. And so they, they, when the stem cells release them, they can be like messages that are being sent from the stem cells to the other cells around them and changing how proteins are released. These stem cells from the hypothalamus release lots and lots of microRNAs. So they took stem cells from the hypothalamus, isolated the microRNAs, and only injected the microRNAs into the hypothalamus of the mice. And it completely reversed the degradation. It extended life, uh, or it, it reduced the rate of aging. For these mice. So mice, once again, we've cured aging in mice. 
That so I need to inject stem found. cells into my brain. No, no, no. Micro me. RNAs. Oh. It's not stem yeah, cells. Right. It's micro RNAs, which is a little bit, you know, stem cells, they can go rogue. And there's, you know, sometimes right. it's like, okay, what are the stem cells going right. to do once they get in there? So how do I get the micro RNAs? Right. That's what we need. That's what we need to work on. Right. Simply yeah. sending away $20 for Dr. Justin's Not a Real Doctor micro RNA pills. Right. There's micro RNA in every pill. Okay, that's not <laughs> But my it. stomach acid will break it up, Justin. Yeah. So, but then there's another question of, you know, what in the first place causes the, the die off of the stem cells? Why does that even happen in the first place? And so, excuse me, there's a thought that there might be uh, inflammation at play and that increased inflammation leads to the reduced birth of the stem cells and the uh, division of the stem cells and activation of the hypothalamus. And so one of the researchers involved says that maybe drugs that are focused on, on stopping inflammation could maintain the hypothalamus at, in a younger state for longer. There's a lot, there's a lot in health and inflammation that we've been learning about in the last few years. So it's an interesting little connection. Got anything else, Justin? Oh, is it uh, that time of the show again where I say some words? Here we go. Greenhouse gases are going up, not down. Oceans are warming and rising. Ice caps are melting. When, uh, when done, we done caught a planetary case of climate. Yeah. Efforts of prevention are far outpaced uh, by efforts to promulgate the problem. So what might be needed uh, in turn is a cure, but how are we going to cure it is the question. Maybe the solution is to do just what got us into this mess in the first place. Geoengineering, a.k.a. climate engineering. And while this is a controversial issue, keep in mind geoengineering, a.k.a. climate engineering, is exactly what we have been doing. <laughs> for a hundred years now by pouring greenhouse gases into our atmosphere we've already engaged in geoengineering <laughs> that's whether we intended it or not is completely beside the point that's what we've been doing a new university of washington study looks at the idea of marine cloud brightening as a way to offset some global warming the strategy would spray salt water into the air to make marine clouds more reflective, more incoming, uh, to re make them reflect more of the incoming solar rays. Small scale tests of marine cloud brightening would also help answer scientific questions about clouds and aerosols, according to atmospheric scientists and a paper published in the journal Earth's Future. The dual goal for the early stage geoengineering tests would follow the US National Academy of Sciences 2015 recommendation that any test of geoengineering also yield a scientific benefit. So, Cody Voice, a major unresolved question on climate science is uh, how much do aerosol particles cool the planet? Said right. lead author Rob Wood, University of Washington professor of atmospheric sciences. A controlled test would measure the extent at which we are able, able to alter clouds and test an important component of climate models. Uh, other co-authors are Thomas Ackerman, Professor of Atmospheric Sciences, Philip Rush at the Department of Energy's Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and Kelly Wanzer, who was not described uh, in terms of their occupation in the document in front of me. The authors are part of a group that is proposing uh, to spray salt water over oceans to cause a small increase in the brightness of marine clouds and boost their capacity to reflect sunlight. Mm -hmm. Doing so could be a short-term measure to offset global warming in a possible future emergency situation. In the meantime, it could also further understanding of our climate system. One of the biggest in uncertainties uh, in, in climate models is the clouds, which reflect sunlight in unpredictable ways. 
Water droplets can only condense on airborne particles, such as smoke, salt, or human pollution. When air contains more particles, the same amount of moisture can form smaller droplets, which creates whiter, brighter, more reflective clouds. Climate scientists believe pollution since the Industrial Revolution has created brighter clouds that reflect more sunlight that have already been offsetting the warming from greenhouse gases, which trap long wave radiation, but they can't pin down the size of the effect or predict how much it might change in the future. So testing out marine cloud brightening would actually have some major benefits for addressing both questions, Wood says. We can perturb the clouds in this way. And are the climate models correctly representing the relationship between clouds and aerosols? Well, that's what their test would. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's this in terms of <laughs> as far as tests go, I mean, this is not the same as putting um, iron particles or silver particles into the sky. It's salt water, and there's lots salt water evaporates, and there's lots of vapor and stuff over the oceans already. This would not be a damaging addition to the clouds. And then you could Possibly. experimentally aerosolize uh, the water at particular, uh, at the, try and get particular sizes of particles and try and really experimentally test mm -hmm. how the clouds brighten and see if it matches the models. And it would just also be really cool. Uh, the yeah. proposal is now waiting on funding. Several years, uh, researchers have been working with a group of engineers in California's Bay Area to develop a nozzle that turns salt water into tiny particles that could be sprayed high into the marine cloud layer. It's the first in a series of steps needed to implement the roughly three-year plan. The researchers propose to produce a sprayer that is able to eject trillions of aerosol particles per second, uh, conduct initial lab tests of that sprayer, do preliminary outdoor tests in a coastal area that is fairly flat, relatively free of air pollution and prone to marine clouds. The proposed site is uh, somewhere near Monterey Bay. Move. Are you saying they're trying to make the Bay Area more foggy? <laughs> That's what it sounds, <laughs> it sounds like. like. <laughs> uh, um, move. move to small-scale offshore test. If tests are successful, people might someday decide whether to use a scaled-up version to create a small increase in the reflection of sunlight over large swaths of the world's oceans. Cody Voice, we're talking about yeah. some kind of new world in terms of the ethical issues, Ackerman said. But for climate, we're no longer in an era of do no harm. We are altering the climate already. It's now a yeah. case of the lesser of two evils. Ackerman uh, is going to be doing some more talking and researching on this. Uh, he's going to be at, uh, actually, when is that? Uh, tomorrow, he's going to be in New Remain at the first Gordon Research Conference on Climate Engineering about the propo uh, proposed test. Another speaker is the leader of Harvard University Test of an alternate proposal to spray reflective particles high into the atmosphere. I think that might be the, uh, the one you were referring to there, Kiki. Yeah. In addition to the paper on the scientific benefits of testing marine cloud brightening, a group of graduate students and professors published a recent paper on what specific measures might be feasible, ethical, and scientifically useful for evaluating a cloud brightening test. The authors include graduate students and faculty in philosophy, atmospheric science, and civil engineering who are part of an interdisciplinary graduate course on geoengineering at the University of Washington. It, it's uh, apparently among the first of its kind. So geoengineering, that's now a thing you can study. It's becoming a get thing. Get a degree in. Yeah. Uh, but also, the uh, question that, is, but the question is, you know, at the same time that we're talking about this, that science fiction is turning into reality, this is, you know, we need to be always asking our, ourselves, is this something that we should be doing? Is this something that is appropriate? Is it going to cause more harm than we currently are causing by the actions that we're already engaged in? And this isn't a blank check to stop the fight to reduce fossil fuels. Right. We right. still need to cut that out. <laughs> Yeah, we need to cut that out. We also need yeah. to do the geoengineering to try and right. reverse some of the problems that are because of all the heating and everything that's going to be happening. That, uh, yes, we, we need both. We need years, both. Decades. We have decades to centuries of heating that are just stored. They're in storage right now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. keep, need to keep adding. We need to keep from adding on top of those and kind of 
exacerbating it, and then we need to figure out how to reverse what we've done. Yeah, but I think you know this uh, this geoengineering has a parallel with biological controls in the biological world, where you know we talk about introducing uh, species to control other species in an environment. Sometimes it works very very well. The majority of the time that we implement it, it does not work very well at all, and there are unintended consequences. That's because we don't entirely understand the systems right. and how all the fact We don't necessarily even know all the factors involved. Bringing it back around to the giant snail. I'm bringing it back mm -hmm. around to the giant snail here yeah. because this is, this is a parallel thing. There are systems at play in the planet, yes. and if we think there's uncertainty in our climate model, like this is what they're testing right. for, you know, yes. to actually go about large-scale geoengineering stuff uh -huh. without understanding all the details. I'm like, yeah, that's it. There's a whole new planet here, people. So yep. I hope they are taking ethics classes in their geoengineering oh. coursework. So, and there is, there, <laughs> the, the, this is uh, interesting. You should say so. That is a, a thing that they're also discussing as a course. That's why I mentioned there was a philosophy major in there. Mm -hmm. That's sort of... Uh, uh, sort of their ask, I think, take on it is is what are the ethics involved? Um, yeah. This is uh, let's see. There's a uh, a Stephen Garden uh, Gardner, uh, who's a UW professor uh, philosophy, wrote a book on ethics of the on the ethics of deliberately tinkering with the planet's atmosphere. He believes an interdisciplinary approach is the right way, way to proceed with geoengineering. His quote here. There's a science question about can we do it? But there's also an ethical question about should we do it? And a policy, a policy question about how we would do it. Ackman mm -hmm. said, I'm an agnostic on this. We want to test geoengineering and see if it works. But the whole time we're working on this, I think we still need to be asking ourselves, should we do it? And of course, again, I'd refer to the beginning of this when I said, we're already doing it. We've been doing it for a long time. Um, yeah, we are already doing it. You're, you're sort of like saying, to an extent. you know, I mean, at this point, when they're talking about something like this, they're like, do you think, do you think we should even look into uh, adding, uh, you know, sort of an organic measure to the, to this little acre of of the farm you know maybe maybe some species maybe we can build a thing that'll attract bees when the other three thousand acres are being covered in ddt it's like yeah like i'm not really too worried uh that the geoengineering that's within our grasp right now is going to have an effect so great that uh it dwarfs the geoengineering we're already doing uh yeah. hopefully we can reduce one perhaps rely on an understanding of and then increase the other to just to keep things nice for humans. Yeah let's, yeah, let's keep it nice for humans. How about that? And, you know, after you've learned this information, I mean, maybe you should, I mean, you can also think about getting a drink. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and then, you know, you might be worried about forgetting some of the things that you've learned. You're like, oh, but I learned something new. Maybe I shouldn't have that drink. Maybe it'll make me forget because, you know, alcohol can make you forget things. Well, in a study out of the University of Exeter, 88 social drinkers were giving a word learning task. They had to learn a whole bunch of words. Then they were split into two groups randomly. And one group was told, go home, drink as much as you like. <laughs> and the other group was said, was told to not drink anything. And then they were told, all right, and then come back tomorrow. Okay, I'm sorry. I apologize. I, I heard Every that the, the instructions for the first group. I think you've put me in the wrong group. No, 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 no. <laughs> I think I can... I'll be really, I can do a much better job in the other group, I think, than, than this one. Is there a way? Is there a switch? Can we? <sighs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the next day they came back to the lab and they had to do the same word learning task that they had done previously. And who do you think remembered more? Well, you said they were given a word, the words to remember while they were drinking. No, no, no. 
Everyone um, was. Everyone's sober. It, everyone was sober. Everyone was sober. Okay. They learned. Everyone was sober. Oh, well, Half of them went home and drank as much as they wanted. Half of them didn't get to drink anything. They came right. back to the lab the next day, took the test again. Who do you think did better? The mm. folks that got to relax at the end of the day. <laughs> and I hope by relaxing, you mean drinking alcohol. No, yes. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one. That's and that's the result. In fact, uh, it here first, kids. <laughs> <laughs> Did they know they were going to get tested the next day? Yes, everyone knew they were okay. going to get tested. So I think Justin's right. They were chilled out. They were like, they didn't Everybody, have interrupted it, sleep so, worrying about it. Yeah, nobody had interrupted sleep uh, being worried about the test the next day for sure. Uh, but the interesting result of this is the people who drank the most did the best. <laughs> <laughs> what the talk about yeah. correlation this does so this doesn't have anything to do with drinking while learning Our, this is nothing yeah. this doesn't have anything to do with drinking while learning we'll drink at school, okay. Kids. Okay. Yeah. but having a drink after learning something oh. it can actually help your retention of the information that you learned. So after cramming for midterms, if you want a glass of wine before bed, maybe that's not terrible. Maybe it's not a terrible thing if you're over 21 in the United States. Right, right. <laughs> so since this so is, so since this is pure, disclaimer, disclaimer. Right. So here's, here's right. the idea. Since this is pure correlation though, and since this is pure correlation, I, I should be free to uh, speculate a little. Can maybe, I maybe part of the reason the folks that were drinking uh, did better on the test is because they were, <laughs> They weren't recreating uh, new memories for a long period of time. Like it might be that they're being preoccupied with the alcohol. The brain was like not absorbing information as well. Exactly. And is you that really it. right? You, that's the oh idea. Oh my gosh! I mean, they don't they don't know this for sure, but this is the idea. It's the hippocampus, the wow. area of the brain that is in, involved in consolidation of memory. It takes stuff that's in short-term memory and transfers it into long-term memory. That the hippocampus, when alcohol is involved, it's it's shutting, it's kind of shutting off. And so the things that you're learning or doing while drinking are not there it's not it's not interfering because it's just not getting through the hippocampus wow. so all the long term memory um, processes that are in place kind huh. of in the after hippocampal stage that because you already learned the information that's already gotten through the barrier but anything new is just getting shut down by the alcohol so it's like the alcohol is allowing your brain to kind of just focus on what it learned earlier because there's nothing else to, yeah. to talk right. about. There's nothing else. No, nothing else happened. What a short oh day gosh. it was. It's like your brain's in a like sensory deprivation chamber. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. So the researchers say Professor Celia Morgan from the University of Exeter says our research not only showed that those who drank alcohol did better that when repeating the word learning task, but that this effect was stronger among those who drank more. The causes of this effect are not fully understood, but the leading explanation is that alcohol blocks the learning of new information. And therefore, the brain has more resources available to lay down other recently learned information to long-term memory. So, so no longer is drinking during the show uh, to be encouraged. Not that it ever was. Maybe um, after. But after, yeah. Save the drinks till uh, the after show. Well, uh, I do and, remember and all the us hard talking content about we'll studies where replicating the 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 atmosphere where you learned the information when you're trying to recall it is also helpful which is why i'd kind of initially asked right about what the what the habitat what they the were in was, yeah. are learning it but this is a whole nother side of things it's very interesting yeah right some fascinating stuff um and then moving into the short stories for the end of the hour do you think you could recognize if um, a panda was in distress? Yes. Justin? Uh, no. Even when they're playing, they're making like weird screechy sounds <laughs> if they make any noise. If they're just sitting there like a lump, I would have no idea. Right. Plus, I'm I'm kind of a ringer. I've you know, studied pain scales in animals for many years. So there, yeah. So you're not the person I want to talk to. Right. 
What about the sound of a pig? Do you think you could differentiate a happy pig sound or from a bad pig sound? Yeah, I think I, I think I've heard enough pig squawk, squalor, squalor, <laughs> squawk, squawking, talking, uh, to be able they're to called tell. oinking, <laughs> oinking versus screeching. <laughs> yeah, anyway. I think I, I think a pig range I could pick up. Anyway, vocalization. There's so maybe some, but maybe not others. But anyway, in the proceedings of the Royal Society B, researchers have embarked on the study of human recognition of vocal expression of emotion in other animals. And um, in their abstract, they say, writing over a century ago, Darwin hypothesized that vocal expression of emotion dates back to our earliest terrestrial ancestors. If this hypothesis is true, we should find cross-species acoustic universals in emotional vocalizations. And so basically, they played a bunch of um, non, uh, they, they played a bunch of vocalizations from amphibians, reptilias, which is birds and reptiles, and mammalia, so all vertebrates, to people. They basically were like, here, put on these headphones, listen to animal sounds. And then they had the animals rate what, whether or not the animals, you know, what, what kind of a sound it was, if they were in distress or, or not. And they found that people are able to identify higher levels of arousal in vocalizations across all species. You're saying including amphibians. <laughs> Amphibia. Amphibia is included. That is fascinating. I would not yeah. expect. Hmm. Wow. Amphibians. Huh. Yes. That is a bit yeah. strange. They had a uh, they had excited giant panda. They had uh, let's see Humans performed better than expected by chance, said the researcher. They accurately selected humans acting out emotional distress at 95% correct and over humans talking regularly, which you would expect. Yeah. Excited giant panda was at 94% correct. Wow. The aroused hourglass tree frog was at 90%. Hmm. African God, bush elephant, 88%. American alligator, 87%. Black capped chickadee, 85%. The pig, 68% which I was surprised at. I think I would yeah. think people would notice arousal yeah. in pigs more commonly. The common raven, 62%, and a monkey called the Barbary macaque at 60%. So, so anyway, pigs was... are interesting because I feel like most of their sounds, they sound like they're in pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's it. I, it's also interesting because it sounds like the, the, the worst people did, I would, would be the ones I would expect them to do better at. Right, yeah. But the main, huh. the main result, though, suggests that humans use multiple acoustic parameters to, right. uh, to sense arousal in vocalizations, uh, but that there are fundamental mechanisms in vocal emotional expression that are shared among yeah. vertebrates. And so it could indicate common a very ancestry. early, yeah, common, it's biologically rooted. Yeah. Fascinating. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Just because we can tell when other animals are screaming for help, this means a big thing for evolutionary understanding of vocalization. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Blair, tell me about those sharks. It is, oh. it is Shark Snark Week. Yes. Um, do you think you'd be able to tell when a shark was about to swallow? I, w I would hope it would just, I think I... I don't know. There, there's lots of teeth involved, I'm sure. Always. I would just always assume that they were ready. <laughs> right. Bamboo way. sharks, uh, they were studied to look at how they swallow because they create kind of suction in their mouth to pull food in. But sharks are known to not have very complicated chewing or swallowing structures in their mouth. For example, you see great white sharks on Shark Week and things like this grabbing onto their prey and shaking their head back and forth. They're not doing that because they're savage and they're trying to tear apart their food because they're, they're so mean. They're doing it because they can't chew. So that's their way of shaking apart pieces so that they can then swallow them. Well, so there's a lot that we haven't learned yet about the mechanisms of how their feeding muscles work. And these bamboo sharks studied uh, at Brown University, uh, from, sorry, University of Alaska at Anchorage and University of Illinois, they looked at x-ray reconstruction of moving morphology, x-rom, 
looking at CT scans of the skeleton with high-speed, high-resolution X-ray movies, aided by tiny implanted metal markers to look at precise visualizations of how bones and muscles move within animals and people. So basically, this is a very fancy way of figuring out how the sharks are swallowing. What they found was their shoulder girdle played no role in shark suction feeding or no it, it played a big role that's what they expected was that it would play no role but instead what they found was that the they they shrug their shoulders and this creates a suction that pulls the food into their stomach so oh they goodness. pull the shirtle, shoulder girdle forward just a fraction of a second after the mouth closed the cartilage rotated backwards from the head to the tail by about 11 degrees, created suction, pulled the food in. So these researchers never would have expected the shoulders had anything to do with swallowing, but it does. And the, the further hyp hypothesis is that um, the shoulder girdle evolved in sharks and other fish specifically for swallowing. We don't huh. yet know because the shoulder girdle appeared right around the same time as jaws that's fascinating so yes. potentially the shoulder girdle which ended up becoming four legs mm -hmm. later wasn't meant for that it wasn't meant for supporting weight it was meant for capturing prey that's wow right. cool <laughs> hold on sorry that's i did that wrong <laughs> that's an interesting <sighs> idea I don't even think I can, I can't even copy that. <laughs> uh, let's see, we'll go, we'll go into a little bit of bad news, a little Australia bashing here. We haven't Australia bashed in a long time, but this, this one, this is some deserved bashing that's going to happen here. The Australian government in the name of balancing economic activities with, conser with conservation, is rolling back marine protected areas that were established five years ago in 2012, reopening more coastal areas to fishing. And one area that is going to particularly be impacted is the Great Barrier Reef. Oh, come on with this. I know, right? I mean, we've talked so much about how the coral and the Great Barrier Reef is being affected by ocean acidification. And now they're saying uh, they're changing it so that 76% of its area will become permissive to fishing, which is compared to 46%, which is currently allowing fishing. Um, although overall in the Great Barrier Reef, commercial activities are going to be reduced. And so oh, they're not gonna be doing trawling. It's not gonna be so activities that are dragging anything along the bottom of the ocean, but there will it will be maybe commercial line fishermen, fishering, fishing, <laughs> commercial line fishing, or um, even tourist-based uh, fishing activities. Most so likely. if commercial activities are being uh, cut back. A little, then, yeah, slightly. Not then, a lot, slightly. No, slightly. Yeah. Yeah, it might, even, it might level out. It might not be worse. Well, I mean, they might be thinking, hey, you keep hearing about the coral reefs disappearing. Uh, right. Maybe we should just get out there and use them while we've got them. Right. That's a that's a great way to live. Um, so with the Great Barrier Reef, there's a couple of things. So the first is that we keep saying it's dead, but it's not. It's just stressed. When a coral bleaches, right. it's because it's stressed out. And a lot of the times the coral can come back, but it right. needs to be given the time and the the safe space, the safe haven to come back. And yeah. and if you're just opening... fishing all the fish, if you're getting rid of all the fish, then that's not right. going to help the ecosystem at all. The other really big problem with opening coral areas up to tourism or fishing or anybody going anywhere near them is that one of the biggest impacts to coral, actually, believe it or not, is uh, sunscreen. So what? yes, uh, ocean wow. acidification is a big problem, but another big problem is that um, the sunscreen gets into the water, coats the coral, and then the photosynthetic algae doesn't get the UV light that it needs. Huh. So oh by using, you have to use eco-friendly sunscreen. Did you even know that was a thing? I didn't even know that was a thing. Eco-friendly sunscreen when you go visit coral reefs. 
Well, that's good. I just heard about uh, some new, I don't know if they're trying to develop it for sunscreen, but people were just studying um, DNA films where you could just rub DNA on skin mm. and it blocked UVA and UVB and also uh, increased hydration of the skin because it reduced evaporation oh of water. Gosh. This was in a dish. Wow. But I can only imagine, they, they, in the paper, they, they said, oh, for wound healing, you could put it on wounds. And immediately I was like, sunscreen? I'm just going to get some DNA sunscreen. Yeah. yeah. We're going to the beach. Hey, will you throw me that bottle of DNA? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. And then uh, one, one story that wasn't on the rundown, but that I think is going to pull a response from Justin for sure. Hey, did you hear that sperm counts are dropping? Uh, that's because of all the, all the need for sunscreen. <laughs> Possibly. In men from America, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand, according to a meta review of many different studies, researchers said this week that the sperm count and quality are decreasing in Western men. Hmm. And it's decreased from something like, uh, it's, it's decreased like 50%. So it's between 1973 to 2011. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily bad because this is like sperm count going from 99 million sperm to 43 million sperm uh, around there uh, and the or 41 uh, million sperm and the the number it, it's it's at now is still within normal the normal range so normal so, fertility levels so the no, yeah so the range okay. that it's that are, they're finding the counts at now still within the normal range still okay but if rates if the the production rate continues to drop um we could we could see some trouble in reproduction kiki in has it finally time. happened have we I, reached I, our carrying I'm, capacity uh, it's either carrying capacity or environmental estrogens or i mean we've been watching reproductive problems occur in frogs We've been watching right. reproductive problems occur in fish. We've in been, otters. We've been seeing animals yeah. around the world, affect, their reproduction affected. And we, we just sit here and go, why would it affect us? Why, right. Why, 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 why. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, maybe, I mean, but there's no, there's no smoking gun here. So right. we have no idea why right. sperm count is on the decline. Um, it could be they, diet also, I just want to say. It if could it's be Western. diet. Yeah, uh, we don't. Western. We don't, as a culture, eat a whole lot of vegetables. <laughs> I and love I, vegetables. I, first, the first thing that pops in my mind uh, is 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 it comparable? Is that comparing to other societies? Is is somebody else's sperm count going up, or some other region of the planet, or is it just? I mean, do they only look at Western society? Because like, that's kind of a strange. Um, no, they also so they also looked at I mean they didn't they didn't look at it specifically they looked at studies that had done research on this between 1973 to 2011. Uh, there were many studies that they looked at that so the 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 effect was seen in North American, European, Australian, a new New Zealander New Zealand males, no decline seen in South America. Asia or Africa in the studies, but it's very possible that just fewer studies have been done in those regions. Yeah, my my yeah. own so personal my personal sperm count has only increased since 1973. <laughs> oh, and one thing they did see in uh, in the results were that with um, there was a difference in sperm count with it being higher for men who had who were um, who were reproducers. So men who had already be, been proven breeders when being involved in a study usually had a higher sperm count than uh, males of unknown status. Oh, use, yeah, use it or lose it, people. Come on. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, guys, you're not going to lose your Y chromosome, but maybe we got to figure out what's going on with sperm counts. Counts and quality, very important. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I hope everyone out there counts on the quality of this show week after week. Because we have come to the end of another show. We're going to be coming back again next week. <laughs> what, Justin? Keep going, keep going.
<laughs> uh, I want to thank you all for joining us again this week. It was wonderful to have you join us. And I would love to shout out to our Patreon sponsors. Thank you, Thunder Beaver, Paul Disney, G. Burton Lattimore, John Ratnaswamy, Richard Onimus, Byron Lee, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Jacqueline Boyster, Tyrone Fong, Andy Gro, Keith Corsell, Jake Jones, Chris Clark, Richard, Charlene Henry, Byron Hedrick, John Gridley, Stephen Bickle, Kevin Railsback, Gerald Sorrell, Ulysses Adkins, Jabe Friedel, James Randall, Bob Calder, Mark Mazaros, Ed Dyer, Trainer 84, Layla Marshall Clark, Larry Garcia, Randy Mazuka, Tony Steele. Gerald Onyago, Steve DeBell, Louis Smith, Paul Harden, Kyle Washington, Greg Guthman, Time Jumper 319, XB, Daryl Lambert, Harun Sarang, Alex Wilson, Jason Schneiderman, Dave Neighbor, Jason Dozier, Matthew Lewitton, Eric Knapp, Jason Roberts, Richard Porter, Rodney, David Wiley, Robert Aston, Sir Frickendelic, Christopher Rappin, Dinah Pearson, Paul Stanton, David, Brendan Minish, Dale Bryant, Aurora Lee, Todd Northcutt, Arlene Moss, Bill Curthy, Ben Rothig, Darwin Hannon, Rudy Garcia, Felix Alvarez, Brian Hone, Orly Radio, Brian Condren, Mark, Nathan Greco, Hexator, Mitch Neves flying out, John Crocker, Christopher Dreyer, RTM, Shu Wada, Dave Wilkinson, Steve Mashinsky, R Remus, Gary Swinsberg, Phil Nadeau, Braxton Howard, Salgan, Sam Metzler, Emma Grenia, Philip Shane, James Dodson, Kurt Larson, Stefan Insom, A Honey Moss, Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapeau, Jason Olds, James Paul West, Alec Doty, Aluma Lama, Joe Wheeler, Dougal Campbell, Craig Porter, Adam Mishkun, Aaron Luther, Marjorie, David Simmerly, Tyler Harrison, and Columbo Ahmed. Woo! Thank you for all your support on Patreon. And if you are interested in supporting us, you can find more information at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Also, remember that you can help Twist out simply by telling your friends about Twist. Tell a friend this week. Do it. On next week's show, once again, we will be back with more science news. And we're going to, we have an interview. I think we're talking about some science fashion next week. Hmm. Maybe. I got to check the schedule. Maybe. I'll check it out. But I hope you come back no matter what, because we'll be broadcasting live online at 8 p.m. Pacific time twist.org slash live where you can watch and join our chat room don't worry if you can't make it though because past episodes are held at twist.org slash youtube or just twist.org thank you for enjoying the show twist is also available as a podcast just google this week in science in your itunes directory or if you have a mobile type device you can look up twist the number four droid app in the android marketplace or simply this week in science in anything Apple Marketplace. -y. And for more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. That's at www.twist.org. That's T-W-I-S.org, where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts or other listeners. Or you can contact us directly. Email Kiki at KikiFinch at gmail.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put Twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line, or your email will be spam-filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter, where we are at TwistScience, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We will be back here next week. It's going to be August. And we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember. It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. 
This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just get understand that we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. 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 And this week in science is coming away. So everybody listen to everything we say. And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die, we may rid the world of toxoplasma. God, the Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got But how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, science, science. This week in science, this week in 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 science. Well, isn't that a fun end of the show? With your mantis shrimp, mantis shrimp, mantis Pew. shrimp, mantis shrimp art. Pew. Yes. Remember when we talked to the mantis shrimp researchers in Baltimore? That was so awesome. It was. I nerded out so hard. <laughs> and then we have oh, your study mantis shrimps. Oh my gosh! Flamby, right. we have a flamby. Flamboyant cuttlefish. That's right. And then we have our good art leopard shark. Speaking of shark weight, looking good. And we have our pangolin. Boop. I love pangolins. And then we have the newest additions. Squirrel. <laughs> Oh, the squirrel story that people have been sending around. Jeez, is that a rabid squirrel attacking people in a park? In Brooklyn? Yeah. And great hornbill. Oh, that's cute. Look at that hornbill. That's a great hornbill, Blair. He is a great hornbill. He's modeled after the great hornbill at the zoo. His name is Hercules. Oh. I'm just imagining you with a little art easel sitting outside the animal enclosures yeah. uh, <laughs> not quite making your art no more like sitting at my desk at home at about 10 30 on a saturday night with a glass of wine <laughs> oh that sounds nice yeah listening to some music nice i was listening to tom waits while i did those oh i like tom waits good choice he's my favorite good choice yeah, so that's calendar art. We're going to be taking pre-orders for our calendar pretty soon. Yes. In August, probably. That'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. Um, what else is going on? I've organized a bunch of interviews coming up in the next 
few weeks. I'm going to Oregon for the first time in my life. In You'll be coming to Oregon. That's right. For the eclipse. For on the, the 21st. eclipse. Um, what are you doing about eyewear? Probably going to get like some paper eclipse glasses for $2. I have some of those on their way. I was trying to decide if I wanted anything more expensive than that. Can, can I give no, you we a also have a welding helmet. So we'll have a welding helmet and we've also got, I, the, we'll get the little paper ones. They're fine. Can I give you a free, absolutely free, no cost thing to look for? A cereal uh, box. Oh. Even better. Uh, a tree with a lot of leaves. Yes, that works for partial eclipses, but I want to see the I want to see the ring. Then you look up right. You look up afterwards. That's that's the that that's when you want the direct you can, look. When it's, you a, when, it's a total when the when it's mm -hmm. totality, we can take off the glasses and we can look up and, and it be inspired stuff. by the uh, the, the darkness. Halo. The, total the darkness, darkness and also the halo around. Yeah, yeah. I can't uh, wait but, for but it to get you, pitch dark in the middle of the day. <laughs> and there are if citizens. You have a, if you have a tree, yeah, if you have a tree though, that's casting a nice a nice shadow, and there's light yeah. kind of filtering through the leaves. Yeah, you'll you get look at that crescents. shadow on the ground. Yeah, and you'll see the you'll see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Yes. Of the eclipses. I, I made a cereal box uh, eclipse viewer last time when it was a partial eclipse in Northern California. Mm -hmm. That's when I that discovered the cool. tree thing. I had all this apparatus stuff and I was like, oh, yeah. this is on the ground and it's way cooler. The other thing someone oh. did that was really cool is they used binoculars and they pointed them at the, at the eclipse and then had a piece of paper underneath. I have mm -hmm. to look it up, but there's something a, you can make a pinhole camera. Yeah, that's what I did. Mm -hmm. But someone else is using binoculars and a piece of paper. You, yes, you can do that because it's like it, it's like a projector. Right. Almost. Yeah. It right. reverses the image. But yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. You can do that. Oh, um, it was neat. Have you guys seen The Expanse? No. All right. You have homework. What before, is that? Before August 23rd. OK. <laughs> what is it? The Expanse is only the best sci-fi program on television. Oh no! Days. How many seasons is it? <laughs> two, two seasons. Okay, I could do that. What's it's it on? Seasons. You'll it's binge watch somewhere? it. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. Great, done. You can get it on Amazon. It's amazing. Expanse. Is it scary? But if, you, but if you would rather, no, no, it's fine. But if you would rather read a book, you can also read some books. Mm. So, I don't have time for books. So it depends on what you have the time for. I, I figured that you'd have more time to watch the TV show than to read yeah. the books. Multitask. Do some calendar drawings. Yes. Um, but we are going to be interviewing the authors of The Expanse in August. Unless That's something really goes awry. Yes. Very excited. I've been, I had a moment on Twitter and I tweeted at one of the writers and i think it was ben rothig actually is he in the chat room right now no ben's what? not in there right now yeah he must have left but i think it was ben on twitter who said something like oh yeah you should talk i was going on about the expanse and he said you should talk to the science advisor for the expanse and then one of the writers piped in and was like well that's all me too <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. And so then I wrote. Would you like him. to talk about? And I said, do you, do you want do you want to come talk about the science? Do you want to do you want to come talk with me? <laughs> That's really funny. That's awesome. Yeah. So they, there's this guy Ty Frank, and um, uh, Daniel Abraham. Ty Frank and Daniel Abraham, and they both write under the pseudonym James S. A. Corey. And Ty Frank actually started The Expanse as the idea for a game. Like he basically created this universe for a card game. And oh then God. they started talking about it and then books. And wow. then now they're doing the best sci-fi television ever. Fascinating. I mean, it's, yeah, it's good. And yes, Ed from Connecticut, the reason that we're talking with them is because the science in the expanse is often cited as the most scientifically accurate space show. So 
So hi, Ben, you are here. Oh, there you are. Yeah, I was thinking it was you who said I should talk to the science advisor for The Expanse. You started it, Ben. You started it. And now we're going to interview the writers. That's great. Yes, Look at us. Excited. Yeah. Let us go. Yeah, that'll be a, I think it'll be a fun show. It'll be awesome. So now you need to watch television. Okay. <laughs> you have homework and you have a month to watch television. So Great. It's not that big a, yeah. Not too much of a push. Awesome. I would like I would like my co-hosts to be slightly informed. Yes, please. As we come into the interview. Aren't we always? <laughs> it depends on what you're informed about. <laughs> Yes, it also depends on if we, we had noticed there would be an interview or not, and there's other things. So now we have plenty of notice. This is great. Mm -hmm. Plenty of notice. Oh, I did too much working out today. I hurt. I have the hurt. I did a beach cleanup. I didn't do that. I did like 100 oh. push-ups. I, um, I forced all of my teen volunteers that were in today to come help me do the beach cleanup. Mm. And Ben, you're right. Naren is the showrunner, not the science advisor. Thank you for clarifying. Yes. Beach cleanup. Did you clean up gross things? Yes. <sighs> uh, I picked up many diapers, a couple bags of dog poop. Yeah, that's that seems about a right. A pair of pants. Did you do you use tongs? Yes, we had grabbers. <laughs> And are you wondering where the, the robot was to help you with the beach cleanup? Yes. Uh, and amongst me and my volunteers, we found seven single shoes. Interesting. Right. My that theory is that no somebody matter. left their, their shoes out and one of the shoes got swept away in the, in the, in the tide. Mm -hmm. And then either they just left their other shoe behind because they were like, well, I, what's the point of having one shoe? Or it got pulled away into the tide and then washed back up later. I think that could happen. Or maybe or, something got buried or, in the sand and they just lost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or, or they were shoes of drowning victims because. Oh, stop that. They, well, no. that's, that's how they, although a lot of the times they find those with the foot still in the shoe. Right. Because they float, because the sneakers float, that's all you'll find is these. They were all like, bunches. no, they were all like flip flops and stuff like that. There's just people at the oh. beach who are being complacent, I'm sure. Uh, but found a lot of cigarette butts. Did find one shotgun shell. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. We found half a buoy. Um, apparently, uh, in the second section of kids, not the kids I was out there with, uh, they were out there with the intern. Um, they found a pipe, <sighs> um, a particular type of pipe. Oh, huh. yeah. Um, yeah. Some people are just really bad at hanging on to their shoes. Yeah, and their but then also just a whole lot of just plastic wrappers, mm. stuff like that. Yeah. Some of it's people just not throwing away their stuff when they're at the beach, but some of it is just that's where trash goes on the street. <laughs> Whiskey Renegade's making me think it was with a candlestick on yeah. the beach. Yeah. With Mr. Shoeless. We did we did find a rope that was knotted that was connected to something um, under the sand and the kids dug away at it for a while and we couldn't find where it was leading to. And they started talking really? about it being a hatch. They were like, are we yeah. lost right wow. now? Is this going to be a hatch? <laughs> <laughs> like, are you guys too young to know about lost? <laughs> oh my gosh. So, so next time now I have to do this next time I go to the beach, the deep hole and anchor a rope down there and then yeah. fill it in again. Just yeah. leave the end of the rope. That's Just littering. Don't do that. I'm going to be inspiring. No. Interesting. Littering. All right, Don't mind. litter. Just ruin my good ideas. <laughs> that means they weren't good ideas, but yeah. 
just do it in the middle of the street. Like next time somebody's paving something, <laughs> just just like draw a hatch and put a um a big metal hoop like a handle onto it. Oh gosh. No, better yet, better yet. Like right after right if they as like somebody sets concrete. Yeah. <laughs> take a dog collar and put one end. <laughs> That's mean. That's so sad. I don't like that at all. That made me sad. I want to go. I want to go. Oh, there's no dog gonna be in that's a joke. It's just the leash. It's, it's all that's funny at all. <laughs> Concrete. At least you didn't find any potato chip cans. Oh my gosh. Why Did is you that bad? You hear this story? No. Oh my goodness. Um so there were potato chip cans from Hong Kong that were not containing potato chips and they oh, were yeah. sent in packages, shipped in packages. You know what they were containing? Some sort of animal, probably. King cobra snakes. Great. <gasps> oh my gosh. <laughs> so it's like it's like the, the in a can. <laughs> yeah, it's like the the can of nuts. Like the gag can of nuts, and then a snake comes out, but it's yeah. real. Yes, but it's real. It was a real Crazy. snake. It was a little hysterical. Uh, Not really. Uh, Not no. really. <laughs> why? 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 Uh, yeah, I'm glad nobody got bitten. It would have been a problem because we don't really have king cobra anti venom like waiting around here nope. yeah so this guy rodrigo franco 34 was smuggling animals into the los angeles area he also had uh yeah these were two foot long king cobras Ugh. three albino chinese soft-shelled turtles oh mm. that's mean i know they um sometimes put parrots in water bottles to Parrots smuggle them. And water bottles. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, sometimes they tape animals to people's legs and stuff, and then they get on an airplane. Mm, yeah, yeah. This so, guy had done this before. When you're buying exotic pets, everyone. No. First of all, you shouldn't do that. Don't. First of all, you shouldn't do that. Blair. Yeah. First of all, de don't. Not. It's a bad idea, Blair. But second of all, if you really want like a chameleon. Or some sort of non-traditional pet. Figure out where it came from and ask for paperwork. And like make sure that this animal was born in captivity. It was not smuggled out of the wild from another country. Because we don't want to support that. No. Ask yourself, where did the animal come from? How long does it live? What does it eat? How big does it get? These are things to ask. Yes. If you crossed a snake with a robin, what kind of bird would you get? Oh. A swallow. What? Why couldn't the female snake have any babies? Why? Because she'd had a hysterectomy. Oh, boy. Oh, gosh. <laughs> what does an exhibitionist snake wear to the beach? A python. <laughs> a python. Where would the thong even go? <sighs> Everything. Uh, yeah. What do you call a snake who works for the government? Uh, a civil serpent. <laughs> oh my gosh. I thought you were going to say Jared uh, Kushner or something. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sorry. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> That's, these jokes are terrible. What do you get when you cross a snake and a pie? A spy. A python. A uh, python. Oh. Oh. Python. <laughs> Why don't snakes need to weigh themselves? Because they have their own scales. Uh, 
<laughs> what do snakes do after they fight? What? Kiss and make up. Oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Yikes. <sighs> <laughs> oh, these are funny. I'm not the gonna... in the chat room. His <laughs> that's funny. A reptile. Why did the snake's wife file for divorce? A reptile dysfunction. Good one, Ed. That was good. Wow. That was good. Wow. A sheep, a drum, and a snake fall off a cliff. What sound do they make? But um, <laughs> you got it. Oh, but um, but um, <laughs> and that's the end of my <laughs> my list of terrible jokes. There are many more. Oh, uh, can we? But I'm not gonna can do we them. do a quick? Uh, can we do a quick tech check? on that uh that thing we were talking about before the show oh, yeah we didn't check with everybody okay so um i'm going to show one of our lovely hosts i'd like to ask everyone in the chat room who do you see on the screen right now who is on the screen for you right now la 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 who is on the screen for you right write the name of the person Chat room's not paying attention anymore. Aha, it's me. Okay, it's good. Thank you, Rob the Invisible. All right. Now, who is on the screen for you now? We have a little delay, don't we? Whose picture do you see now? Ah, we got a Justin. There we go. Okay, that worked. Awesome. And who do you see now? Is it me? Stop talking, Blair. Whose picture do you see now? It's Shouty. Even, actually, even with me talking, if you've got it locked Shouty. on, it should That's still you. be her. That's right? right. Yeah. Yeah. Karen. Karen. <laughs> Karen. Yeah, see, it works. It works. We don't see it. I see it. You yeah. guys don't see it. Yeah. But the audience sees it. I told you. Ed, yep. get out of here. Yeah, no, Brandon BR, I know it does. We had a debate about it, though, because um, I see the change, and I, I was pretty sure you all saw the change, but then Justin and but Blair we don't, yeah. don't see the change. So the guests in the Hangout, the person who runs the Hangout sees it. People in the guest in, who guest do not and yeah, we just see whoever's talking shows up there, that's um, what except for our, ourselves. I, guess. I was just yeah. reminded, speaking of Karen, has anyone seen Spider-Man Homecoming? Uh, no. I want to see that. There's definitely a Karen shout out in there. <laughs> that's awesome. Karen! And it was freaking me out a little bit in the, in the theater. You think somebody watches Twists? No. Oh, yeah. Is it in there for you? Of course you? they do. Yeah. Of course they do. Why wouldn't they? I had a great. Everyone watches. I had a great moment. I was interviewing somebody for the stem cell podcast, a stem cell scientist. Uh huh. And when we started the interview, he says, oh, "Before we get started, I just have to let you know I've been I've been watching your stuff since like 2006." Aww. He's like, "I've been listening Gosh. to your stuff. I was with you guys when you were on Twit. I've been I've seen Twist. I love Twists." <laughs> and I was like, "Oh yay! That was awesome." That was pretty cool, like to have a, a different kind of interaction there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I was just I was messaging with someone, an old coworker, right before the show, and she told me that um, one of her car her carpool mate loves our show. That's awesome. Hey. Yeah. You carpool mate. Yeah. Carpool mate. Yeah, That's Karen, funny. get out of Spider Man, Karen. Nobody wants you there. I like I like finding people in the world who listen to twists or watch us on the intertubes. It's very exciting. It's very exciting. 
I know you guys are there in the chat room. I know you're there and I've met some of you. I know you are there in the YouTubes. Oh, hey, somebody needs to be shut down there. Huh? Oh, somebody is being rude. Oh, in YouTube? Or, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Somebody just started. Uh, I think Fada left the and stopped um, moderating. Stopped moderating. And so now there's just a bunch of rude comments. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, back to the nice side of things. Uh, I really like yeah. <laughs> what has science done for you lately because it's, it's we're already getting a lot of names I haven't seen before. And that's really cool because it definitely shows how how much wider our reach is. Because a number is one thing, but then to hear from these people a new person every single week is really cool. It is. I love hearing and I, and we've started getting more. I'm um I'm now scheduled scheduled out for until the end of August until the middle of September with responses from people, which I'm really excited about. And they're all different and they're all individual stories and they're just wonderful. That's great. Very cool. Yeah. That's good stick. It's yeah. a good, uh, good new, uh, whatchamacallit, part of the show there. Yeah, I like it. Segment, Sorry. new segment, that's what I like. Yeah. Hey, everyone on YouTube. I really like it when you're when you're nice and don't. It's not a place for rudeness in our chat room. Not a place for rudeness. Sorry. Be nice to each other, people. Yeah, I like having you all here to join us to talk about science, but I don't appreciate. Uh, I don't appreciate the rude talk. Sorry, Ethan Murphy. If you do have a real question, you could answer the. You could ask your question, but you haven't asked the question you just keep wanting me to notice you i did hello and no seo chameleon if a twin has sexual intercourse with a twin they will not necessarily make a twin oh is that possible can they make another version of themselves no i mean it, it, genetically they're predisposed just, just, just. to having twins but they won't necessarily have twins yeah and it's not yeah it's not but would the twin look like the parents? Oh my God, would they clone themselves? No, Let's I don't know. I think that's, I'm pretty sure now that's how that works. <laughs> there are reasons why we don't um, we we don't suggest first relatives breeding with each other, direct relatives. Yeah. Yeah. But I know identity four. It's not good to notice the rudeness, but yeah they get rude they get rude i don't know why they want to spend so much time being rude all right i am going to <laughs> i'm going to leave the youtube chat because there's just rudeness over there and i have a much nicer chat room over here sorry i really like it over here a live stream on twitter yeah it could be even worse i've had some pretty crazy moments on uh, Periscope in the past. Yeah. Yeah. I've had some interesting comments from people on Periscope. I just, I try to ignore them. I just let them pass. It's like flowing water. Oh, that's so interesting. The commentary. But it's not, um, those people, it's not visible later? Uh, I think it might be. Yeah. Okay. I think the comments are visible when people, but the periscopes are only available for 24 hours. So I don't know how many people actually go back and watch them. Hmm. I mean, you can download them and then upload them other places for posterity, but yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hot Rod, you're like, no, don't do it. Yeah. All right. Is it time for Karen to go to bed? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Is it time for us to go to bed and not? Yeah, I'm ready for bed. It's, I mean, mm. yeah. It's when you start looking at the negative comments, it's time to go to bed. I haven't, I haven't seen them, and I just, I don't, I don't care. 
Yeah, I made yeah, the mistake nice going over there. If they weren't there, of course, uh, we could be shut down. Yeah. Or whatever. I, I don't care. Also, like yeah, I don't expect. I, I don't go into any comments to anything anymore and go, "My gosh, this people are not not honoring the uh, <laughs> the story that this is under." Or the like. It's this is this is troll chat room uh, America now or, or world. This is. Trolls, trolls all have home on the internet as well as mm -hmm. all the good things. So. It's just the way it is, people. Just the way it is. Yeah. Word. Yeah, we have a, a question from the YouTube that is a, a fair question, but I can't answer it because it's not something that def I necessarily know. Oh, that's the question. I'll answer it even if I don't know the answer. Yeah, maybe you can. Ethan Murphy 8272 is saying, I got my girlfriend pregnant and she took a plan B pill and she's still showing positive on the pregnancy test. Why is it doing that? Well, it depends on how long it's been too. Yeah, I don't know how long ago you took the plan B. Uh, I would recommend if it's been a while, talk, go back and get a doctor's pregnancy test just to be, be sure some of these... Um, like plan B, I don't know. It might be a hormone from the plan B, like progesterone that might uh, still be lingering at high levels. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly how it works. So I can't specifically answer the question. What? Yeah. Okay. Third try. Yeah. Okay. Now you're trolling me. No plan B doesn't work in the third trimester. So, uh, uh plan C. Uh, plan C, uh, plan C, which is go get the uh, book. It's uh, written by Doctor Spock. This is not the <laughs> Star Trek character. Um, it's about parenting and how to be a better parent, how to prepare yourself for the trials and tribulations of the rest of your life of being a parent. Good luck. Yeah. Third trimester. Oh boy. Okay. Good luck. Yeah. Plan B you're supposed to take very, very soon. After right planning. away. Right away. It doesn't work in the third trimester. Too late. Um, anyhow, uh, I, yeah, I recommend talking to a professional about your concerns. <laughs> and um, on that note, oh, yeah. This is why okay. I, I, right. love, right. I love um, auto moderating. It's wonderful. Say goodnight, Blair. That's goodnight, what we're Blair. Do. That's Say good night, Justin. Good night, Justin. Say good night, Kiki. Good night, Kiki. Kiki. Thanks, everyone, for watching. We'll be back again next week. We really appreciate you being here and hope that you'll join us again for the science. <laughs>